Stunned by the recent death of a two-year-old girl at the center of a hard-fought California custody case, some people wondered what might have been done differently to prevent this tragedy. Although this uh, case is still under investigation, news reports indicate that Madeline Layla Saman Fay likely died as a result of a murder-suicide by her father. The deaths uh, followed an award of custody to the girl's mother. Uh, my guest is the host of the Family Law Channel, retired uh, California Superior Court Judge Eugene Hyman. Welcome, Judge. Good to see you Thank again. You. Thank you. This, this story um, is so unfortunate, uh, brings so many uh, things to, to light here. Let's talk about your uh, take on this. Just basically from that introduction, what are you guessing could have been done differently here just to begin with? Well, n number one, uh, this is uh, unfortunately uh, something that happens very common uh, throughout the United States. Um, unfortunately, also, uh, what is not recognized is that uh, almost always in this kind of a situation, uh, there uh, was uh, domestic violence uh, in this particular family. Um, we know from research that with respect to domestic violence, that frequently a parent who is abusing a partner will also abuse the child and the various ways in which uh, child abuse occurs uh, can be psychological physical and also uh, involving sexual assault um, i'm willing to bet my bar card that uh, this investigation will show ultimately that there was family violence involved in this particular case now i'd love to know uh, what uh, kinds of information um, is available uh, in the family law file in terms of what kinds of clues there are there um, in terms of violence. If, as the um, media uh, sources seem to indicate, that this uh, incident occurred after a, a change in uh, custody mm -hmm. orders, that would suggest to me that uh, the reason why that change occurred was because a judge was satisfied after a contested hearing that there were uh, reasons to be concerned about this father having uh, different kinds of access with respect to his daughter, and as a result made new orders. And as a result of those new orders, uh, this father, uh, for whatever reason, uh, killed his child and then suicided thereafter. Uh, so there, there was information. Now, whether this information um, was given to uh, the police or with respect to other authorities uh, in terms of trying to uh, protect uh, the uh, mother and the child, um, I don't know. But what should happen in a coordinated uh, community is that uh, even if the police aren't involved, at least advocates are involved. So if this... Um, person was committing or perpetrating uh, violence against the uh, mother and or uh, the daughter, then there should have been uh, protection orders that would happen if the criminal case were uh, in involved uh, and um, restraining orders with mm -hmm. respect to the family law case. Also, um, in an extreme situation, Child Protective Services uh, might uh, be involved. Um, the other thing that needs to happen now uh, after uh, this unfortunate circumstances, this case needs to be uh, sent to a death review uh, committee within the county so that uh, various collaborative partners within the community can evaluate this case and see what went wrong. How could this have been avoided? Um, it might have been avoided, uh, but at least uh, we can now learn something from this unfortunate circumstance in terms of um, what kinds of support needed to, uh, to occur in order to make this more likely not to have happened. When a child uh, like this is uh, essentially caught in the middle of a contentious custody uh, battle, is it typical for uh, the child to have an attorney in this in a case like this? In a the the preferred response is in any kind of a very high conflict uh, kind of case to for the court to appoint a, uh, an attorney to represent the child especially when that child is so young that the child doesn't have an effective way of indicating to the court what its preference uh, is with respect to um, uh, staying with the parent or which parent and, and also um, advocating on behalf of the child in terms of what's in the child's best interest um, especially if the parents don't have attorneys uh, of their own in, in terms of being able to effectively marshal evidence and to give that to the court in terms of decision-making. I don't know whether these uh, parents uh, had attorneys, 
but whether they did or whether they didn't, um, in a very high conflict kind of case, it would be helpful to the court if there were an attorney appointed to the child for the child. Unfortunately, because of our economic times, mm-hmm. um, this isn't happening as often as it uh, it might have happened uh, ten years ago when uh, the situation was much better economically. Uh, usually. Um, appointments of, of counsel for children wind up being paid for by the court. In an unusual situation where the parents have uh, some money, uh, then the court can appoint it and then order that the uh, parents uh, split or that one parent or the other pay the majority of the uh, the cost. But this is the most effective way, I think, for a child to be able to have input or to get information to the court in terms of mm-hmm. these important decisions that have to be made. And so we're talking here about a situation where there are certain uh, divisions of the court, perhaps, that aren't communicating. Um, Is it typical, okay, given these economic times, that there actually is a death review panel that would look at a situation like this and try to come up with ways to prevent it from happening again? Well, there is in Santa Clara County, uh, San Jose is the uh, the county seat. Uh, We do examine every uh, domestic violence-related death in the county to try and learn lessons and to try and make sure that 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 particular kind of uh, situation doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether uh, Sacramento County has a death review or not. Hopefully they do. But the other uh, problem that you just alluded to in your question is information sharing between the various divisions. The most common two divisions that are involved with a family when there is domestic violence um, is the criminal division and the family law division. Unfortunately, there isn't a easel, information isn't easily exchanged between the two divisions, number one. And number two, the other thing that's upsetting is that the lawyers, the criminal lawyers and the family lawyers, don't communicate with one another and don't exchange information. And they're not helping the judges in those two divisions either. Mm -hmm. Because even if the attorneys were aware of information, then they could bring it to the attention of the court. But my experience has been, generally speaking, that the attorneys don't know. They don't make the inquiries. They don't ask the right questions of their clients to find out if, in fact, other divisions of the court are involved. And um, there isn't the information sharing. This lack of information sharing increases the likelihood of uh, uh, bad orders being made. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but in California, where there's a hierarchy of orders, that means that the criminal orders take preference over uh, abuse and neglect orders, over uh, family court orders, juvenile orders. If there isn't that exchange, then those orders aren't the most current. And what happens in criminal usually is the order that's issued there by the judge says follow all juvenile and family court orders. Um, The judge could issue his or her own orders that would involve custody, but usually defer to those other divisions because there's the feeling that those other divisions have more current information and that those judges are in a better situation better situated, rather, to be able to make those kinds of decisions. But if the information isn't current, uh, then those orders are not going to be as helpful. And by deferring to them, you're you're causing additional difficulties in terms of putting children and uh, parents at risk. Uh, In closing here, as kind of an odd legal side note here, the father's brother, uh, who happens to be an attorney, uh, was interviewed by the media and, and said, probably at a moment of anguish, he said, I think my brother did the right thing. Um, I think justice has been done here, which seems totally illogical. Uh, But the California bar now is looking at uh, at taking away uh, his ability to practice law. What's your take on that? I I don't see them as doing more than a private, at most, what's referred to as a private reproval. That means Mm -hmm. they would privately admonish him that his conduct is in violation of his obligations uh, as an attorney to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California and to obey all laws. Um, He subsequently, in what I've read with respect to the media, has subsequently uh, retracted and apologized for that statement, uh, I just don't see the uh, the bar is so b- behind no. in, in terms of their investigations of people that are swindling clients. Mm-hmm. I just don't see them as taking any kind of action at all. Mm-hmm. Well, um, as always, we appreciate your keen uh, insight and expertise in this area, as always, uh, Judge Hyman. Thank you. 
Uh, my guest has been the host of the Family Law Channel here on the Legal Broadcast Network, retired uh, California Superior Court Judge Eugene Hyman. I'm Scott Drake. Thanks for watching.